We're going to open, like I said, Philippians 4, 14. This is the last statement in the book of Philippians. This, this last two paragraphs we're going to read. This is how it ends. And I think it's no accident the Apostle Paul kind of begins the letter thanking the Philippians for their provision for him in jail and thanking God for all that he's done during his imprisonment. And now he's going to end with the same thought that, that they have come and they have sent Epaphroditus to him to bring him goods that he needed while he was in jail. Because again, we think of jail and prison in America as you're taken care of while you're there. You know, they provide your meals. Um, you have a bed to sleep on. And uh, it's bare bones. But in, in the ancient times, there was none of that. And Paul wasn't in prison yet. He was in house arrest. But basically that was prison. And regardless, he couldn't leave. He was completely dependent on the generosity of people that he knew to come and take care of him. And so that's what they did. And they sent Epaphroditus from hundreds of miles away. Which is a long time, a long way by today's standards, but in ancient times, it was even further. And he brought all of these things, these gifts from the Philippian church. And so with it's, it's with, with that in mind that we're going to talk today about generosity. And not just the generosity of us to others, but of the church to itself and, and to the world, but also of God to us and us to God in a sense. Let me read this to us. And then we'll unpack this together. Philippians 4.14, It was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you and all the saints greet you especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let me pray for us. Lord, would you help us today to trust you? Help us to be generous. Help us to be wise. Help us to set our eyes on eternity and not this world. As we seek your glory in all things, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here's number one. Three principles I think we can pull out of this. First is it's right, it is right for churches to support pastors and missionaries. It is right for churches to support pastors and missionaries. That's exactly what they were doing for Paul. That's what they had been doing kind of all along. He said, it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except for you only. And even at Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. That they recognized Paul's calling, his being set apart by God for this special work of ministry. And they, it says they entered into partnership with him in giving and receiving. That he gave them the gospel, he gave them the truth of God's word, he gave them care, he gave them spiritual support, and in turn, they supported him financially and physically. They made sure he had a place to stay and food to eat and that he was taken care of. And, and that makes sense to us. Well, he's in there. They're in Philippians. Like we, can, we can understand that. They're in Philippi with the Philippians. But then when he leaves and he goes on to Thessalonica farther away, they continued to send him help. And we know that, that that was a practice that was happening for Paul all throughout his ministry. That he was supported usually by the churches where he was, but also by other churches who loved him, who knew him, who saw the good he was doing, and wanted to make sure that he continued to do it with full and total focus. This is a principle that we see repeated several other times in the scriptures as well. And the reason that I want to think about this today is that there are movements, there are 
people popping out there, pastors who were saying things contrary to this, who were saying, well, it's not the church's job to support pastors. It's not the church's job to support missionaries. But the Bible teaches us that it is. Matthew 10, 9 through 10. When Jesus sent out the disciples, the 12 disciples, possibly more, um, he tells them, take no gold or silver or copper for your belts. So don't take any money with you. No bag for your journey. Don't even take clothes or two tunics or sandals or a staff for the laborer deserves his food. For the laborer deserves his sustenance. That's another way we can understand that word. So when he sends the disciples out fairly early on, this was not at the end. This was before that. He sends them out and says, go town to town and find good people there and preach the gospel wherever you go. And God will provide for you and the people there will take care of you. For the laborer deserves his food. Okay? So then we see the same principle again for the apostles. And then I think extended beyond that in 1 Corinthians 9, 3 through 14. I'm going to read you all three of these paragraphs because I think they're, they're all connected and he's making the same point. He says, This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same? For it's written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we've sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, don't we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Fairly straightforward. I want to just point out a couple of things there to you. The context here is, is interesting. In, in the ancient times, when Paul was writing in the New Testament era, there were these traveling teachers who would walk around from city to city, and they would teach. And sometimes it was spiritual things, sometimes they were philosophers. But the idea was they would come and they would essentially exchange their knowledge or their, um, their rhetorical skill sometimes for money or for support. Or that was, that was the way that they would make their living. And so Paul specifically in this situation in Corinth chose not to receive any money from anyone there because he didn't want to be confused with those who were also traveling around and teaching all kinds of other weird and wild things. He wanted them to not have any question of his motives while he was there. And so he says, I didn't, me and Barnabas, we didn't make use of this right. And so instead he, he made tents on the side while he was there in Corinth. We know he may have done something similar when he was in Thessalonica. Uh, he mentions that to the Philippians. But he also mentions in the letter of 2 Thessalonians that there were some who had quit their jobs to await the coming of Christ and had just become basically bumps on a log and a liability to everybody around them. And he says, you guys know when I was with you, not even we, not even we were just sitting around. He said, we were working with our own hands to set a good example for you of how to live. And so he said, there are times when we don't do that. But then he makes all these other arguments, all these other analogies for why it is that the church should support those who teach and preach the gospel. He says, do we not have the right to eat or drink? That's how he starts it. He calls that the right to eat or drink. Again, speaking particularly of the apostles, but the way he ends it is that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Uh, he says, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? So he, you can imagine that analogy of the soldier. And soldiers sometimes were probably seen to be just sitting around, but they never were. Soldiers never were sitting around. They were always on guard. They were ready, in fact, to lay down their lives for the people. And he says, nobody serves as a soldier at his own expense. Or who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Again, just these analogies of the world. We recognize that those who work, receive. And then he appeals to the Old Testament and says, the, the, do not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. 
Again, that, that idea being that even the ox working in the field as it's pulling the plow or pulling the tread to the millstone to crush the grain was allowed to eat. They didn't put a muzzle on it so he could get some of what it was, what it was crushing. He got to participate in the blessing that was happening. And he says, God isn't speaking just about oxen, but for us, for our sake. Because the plowman should plow in hope, the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. And so again, you get the idea. He appeals to the Levites as well and to the Levites in the temple. Remember, they had no land, and so they couldn't grow any food. They had no livestock of their own. And their food and their, their livelihood, their sustenance came from the generosity of the people, either giving special offerings or bringing their sin offerings to God. The Levites got to participate in that. And that's kind of the idea. And, and I don't say any of that to, to make anyone feel convicted about anything. This church is, has, has blessed me in this regard as a pastor. This is kind of an awkward thing to even talk about. But the Bible is clear on this. And, and, I'm, and I'm blessed that I get to make a living serving here among you guys and it frees me up and it frees up other pastors and missionaries to be able to focus and that was the idea here to be able to focus on the work to be able to focus on the gospel and on the word and on the prayers for the church and and on the ministry that needs to happen and all the behind the scenes things that take place here's first timothy 5 17 through 18 let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, again, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. So all that to say, I think we see here this principle that it's good and right. It's good and right for churches to support pastors and missionaries. That's a blessed thing. Now, is it required for, for a pastor to take a salary from a church or to be paid by a church? I don't think so. Not at all. Like, like we see Paul, he said there were situations where he didn't do that for a specific purpose. He wanted to, to teach a better lesson. He wanted to show them a better example than he, he would have been able to if he had been paid by the church. But it did, he, and he talks about this in other places, it did kind of hamstring his ministry. It, it made it hard for him. He had sleepless nights, he said, in times that he went without food and things like that because he, he cared so much to set that example for the rest of the church. But then in all other ways, in, in all other places, it seems that that was the pattern. And it was a good and a right thing to do. Okay, so here's number two. With that kind of in mind, giving to God's work in whatever way, giving to God's work results in heavenly credit. Heavenly credit. Giving to God's work results in heavenly credit. Verse 17, he says, Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I've received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. And then he recognizes that those gifts weren't just for him necessarily, but that they were a fragrant offering and an sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And so he, he sees the Philippians giving faithfully, giving intentionally, giving sacrificially to the work of God and the work that he was doing. And he says, there's fruit that is coming for you, and this is a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. That in a sense, he recognizes that what they're doing is not just giving from person to person, but they're, they're participating in kind of a spiritual currency exchange. And I, and I say that carefully because I'll talk about this in a minute. The, what I'm saying is not prosperity gospel. I'm not saying you give certain things to God and God has to give things back to you. That's not the idea. The idea is that when you give to God, he blesses you. That when you give to God, it's never wasted. When you give things to the Lord, when you support his work, when you give for his kingdom and his, his purposes, that he gives you heavenly credit. Here's Matthew 6, 19 through 21. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there your heart will be also. And that's such a, such a genius way that he phrases that. Because you can just immediately envision what he has in mind. Somebody who just has a spare room full of wealth. It's just stored away, hidden away. And they open it up maybe once a year. And eventually they open it up and find that all the fine clothes that they never wore that were just waiting are eaten up by moths. 
And all the precious metals that they had were rusted and tarnished and ruined. And maybe they open it up one day and it's all gone because a thief came in and stole it. But he says, instead of doing that, instead of hoarding our wealth away in whatever way, right? Not just talking about money, but whatever we have that God has blessed us with our time, our, our talents, our abilities, our giftings, and, and also our, our financial wealth, that if we use it strategically for good in the world, for God's will, for accomplishing his things, when we give to those in need, when we support gospel ministry, when we give to the church to make sure the church is healthy and strong, when we give to whatever good end, that we transfer those things from our storeroom where moth and rust can destroy to heaven where nothing ever can destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal, where there are no moths and there are no rust. And then here he says that the main reason that we do that is not just so that we'll have this reward awaiting us in heaven, although he says we will, but that wherever our treasure is, is where our heart is also. Maybe you've experienced that. I, I have. Where you, you want something and then you buy it. And then you have one more thing to worry about, right? Like, I, I have a friend who bought a boat. And he, I asked him, man, how, how are you enjoying the boat? And he said, never buy a boat. That was his answer. Because what happened was he had this boat that he'd always wanted. And he found out that, well, he has to make sure it doesn't get dry run. And he has to make sure it's insured. And every time he put it in the water, something's wrong with the motor. And all these liabilities that he'd never had before came along with the boat. And that's just one example. You can think of so many other things that we take on and they become liabilities for us in this world. Or if you just hoard your money away in a bank or you stick it in the mattress. Well, you don't want the kids to jump on the bed anymore because they might launch the money out of the mattress, right? That you just are worried about your heart is wherever your treasure is. And Jesus says, man, put it in heaven where nothing's going to touch it. Give it to good things. Give it to good work. Give it to those in need. Give it to spread the gospel. And then you can be certain and sure that you will have a reward in heaven that is untouched. And you'll be able to have a heart set on eternity instead of on all the things of this world. Now, I'm not saying you can't have a boat. And I'm not saying you shouldn't ever have anything that requires maintenance or care. Right? We live in the world. And sometimes we can leverage our money toward a house or a vehicle, or tools, or instruments, or all kinds of things that allow us to do more and better in this world. But the problem is when we get in this habit of just spending on ourselves, and our wants, and our desires, that our hearts sink down out of heaven and live on this earth, and we become focused on all the things of the world. And I think ultimately God wants better for us than that. The church is not a play to get all your money. That's not the idea. That if anything, God's desire is for you to be set free from your concern over all of your earthly wealth. And to be able to to have a peace in your heart, knowing that you've done the best you can with what God has given you. So that's number two. Giving to God's work results in heavenly credit. Here's number three. When we trust him with our resources, God supplies what we need when we need it. When we trust him with our resources, God supplies what we need when we need it. God supplies what we need when we need it. I wanted that to be shorter, but I also didn't want to steal anything from that. Because here's what he says. Number, verse 19. My God will supply and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So the idea there being with that and, that as we give, God supplies what we need. And I'm not saying that we need to be stupid about how we give, because you can be. Now, it, it's, hard, it's hard to... Let me say it this way. I've never seen anybody impoverish themselves by being too generous. You can, give it, you can give in a way that's stupid and in a way that's selfish, where you want to look good to everybody else, and so you, you buy things foolishly, or you even buy things for other people foolishly. But the idea there is that as we give to God, 
as we hold on to our earthly wealth with a loose hand, God is able to, in a sense, trust us with whatever we need. That he, he'll give it. That he'll supply it. That just like Paul said, that they entered into this fellowship, this partnership, this communion of giving and receiving with him. The idea is that we do the same with God, I think. That we enter into a relationship of trust with him. And we give as he prompts us, as he gives us opportunity, as he supplies, and then he gives us whatever we need. And that the more loosely, I really do think, the more loosely you can hold on to the things of this earth, the, the less you care about material things and material wealth. Like I said, in a sense, I think more the more that God can trust you with those things, the more that your heart becomes free to handle them. Now, that's not prosperity gospel. Let me say that clearly. That's not what I'm saying. I don't think that's in the Bible. I think anyone who tells you sow a ministry seed and God must bless you with money is a liar and a charlatan and they're trying to get money out of you. That's all they're trying to do. Anybody who says, oh, you can't pay the bills this month, well, just give $1,000 to my ministry and then you'll be blessed. Because if you notice, very rarely do those guys ever say, you know what, go and give $1,000 to all those around you in need and then you'll be blessed. What they say is give it to me. And that's not what I'm saying here and that's not what God's saying. That what I'm saying here is as we give, God supplies. That as we become generous people, we can be, have a confidence that God will be generous to us. Here's Luke 6.38. Here's another, just a clear statement of this. Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Notice the way he phrases that. Give and it will be given to you. And most of the New Testament, most of the Old Testament, is agricultural metaphors, right? This is talking about grain. You go buy grain, you have your container. Maybe it was your shirt. That was probably what they would use. Have a pocket of some kind sewn into a shirt. So good measure, so plenty put in, pressed down, shaken up so that everything settles, and more put in running over to the point that it can't hold anymore will be put into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And all this in mind, I think what he's saying is the more stingy we become, the more stingy God is with us. And God gives grace. Of course he gives grace. God blesses us in ways that we don't deserve all the time. But there really is a, a principle at work here that the more that we're willing to be generous, the more generous God can be with us. And this goes with other things too. We read in other places like, uh, give grace, give mercy. God is merciful to those who are merciful. And to those who are not, there's judgment. We read that with the measure of judgment that we give to others, right? Jesus says, take the speck out of your eye or the log out of your eye before you get your brother's speck for the measure that you use. It'll be measured back to you. It's almost the same exact phrase. The idea being that there is a sort of a sort of reciprocity. And I don't say this is not a transaction. And I think that's that's the difference here. Well, I'm not saying you give God things, God gives you things. It's not what it is. It's not like you put a coin in the vending machine. It's a relationship of generosity. It's a it's a a relationship of giving and receiving with God. Because the prosperity gospel ends up turning Jesus into a vending machine. And I just don't want us to do that ever. Or a genie. God is, you don't rub the Bible three times and then you get a wish. That's not how it works. And then there's no amount of good deeds that you can do to ultimately earn God's favor toward you. Where now he has to give you things. It's not, it's not how it works either. We're not earning points toward some kind of favor with God. But it's that as we become more generous, as we become more merciful, as we become more gracious, as we become more kind and compassionate, we change. And so then our relationship with other people changes and our relationship with God changes too. Because God is merciful to those who show mercy and he is compassionate to those who are compassionate. And he is generous with those who are generous. That the more we become like him, the more he's able to pour himself out to us. And then he ends by saying this. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. And the brothers who are with me greet you. 
And all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Because remember, all of this, all of this takes place within this church community that we have. With, with, with us as believers here together and with us as believers in the, in the greater world and then us as believers to the, to the unbelieving world as well. But that all that we have and all that we are and all the blessings of God for us come to us through Christ Jesus, who we receive, again, not by doing, but by, by faith. That we don't give in order to get from God. We give because God has already given us everything. And that ultimately our relationship to God is never one of giving him something that he needs, but of striving to give back to him out of the abundance that he's already given us in Christ Jesus. That while we were still sinners, the Son of God came and got nailed to a cross for us. He wasn't guilty. He didn't have any sins of his own. He took our sins, died for us, and gave us everything else instead. And that all the blessings of heaven were earned for us while we were still sinners. And so the beginning of all of this is a relationship of trust and faith with, with God. And that's, that's why I say that when we trust him, then God supplies what we need when we need it. But I also don't want to, to, to glaze over the promise there because that is, a, that is a, a tremendous promise. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And if you want to ask, well, how rich is God? He has everything. Everything's his. Everything under the whole heaven belongs to God. And everything in heaven, too, belongs to God. He made it. It's his. And he made us. And we're his. And so whatever it is that we need, God has it. Whatever it is that you need today, whatever you're worried about, whatever thing you think you lack, whatever you're afraid he's not going to provide, he has it. It's his. And he will. That's the promise. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And sometimes... God doesn't give us everything we want. Again, that's why I say it's not a transaction. You don't say, all right, God, I want this car, so I'm going to sow this ministry seed. It doesn't work that way. God says, you give, and then I'll give you everything you need. Or really, because I will give you everything you need, now you're free to give. My God will supply every need of yours. Again, God sees what we need. He knows what we need. Before we ask him, that's what Jesus tells us in Matthew 5. The disciples say, teach us how to pray. In Matthew 7, teach us how to pray. And Jesus says, well, all right. And he does. He gives him the Lord's Prayer. And he says, your heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask him. Every need will be supplied by our God who loves us. So, with all that in mind, I guess I want us to close today with this thought. If you're here today and you're a believer in Christ and you've come to God trusting in him to rescue you from sin and death and everything else, then you now have a relationship with the God who owns the whole world. And so now you're free to give in whatever way you see fit. In whatever way God prompts you to, he's going to supply. He gives it. And as we look and say, well, what kind of generosity am I supposed to have? Well, how does God give? He gives everything to everyone who asks, everything that we need, he supplies. And so if I, if I want you to err, if God wants us to err in any direction, we need to make sure that we err toward generosity, that we give too much and not too little. Because this is the other thing that I've learned. I, I have never given and said, man, I wish I hadn't been so generous. Not once. Isn't that interesting? Not once. Whether that's to, like I said, to a ministry, to a missionary, to somebody in need. Now I'm wise with what I give, and I think we all should be too. We don't want to enable. We don't want to become a liability ourselves. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we are like God in this way. That as he has given us everything in Christ, now we stand ready to give whatever we can to every need that we encounter, trusting that he will supply whatever we need as we go. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you 
for your great love for us. That in Christ Jesus, we can be confident that you will provide. That whatever it is, whatever lack we feel, whatever need we encounter, you stand ready to open heaven for us, to provide for every need that we have. Lord, help us to be responsible. Help us to work hard. Help us to be wise. Help us to be careful. But, oh God, help us to be generous as well. Help us to be people who love those around us, open our eyes to the needs of those around us. Lord, help us to meet those needs. Help us to give to you as we give to others, to show the world that you are a giving God. You have been so kind and so good and so generous to us. And we love you. And we thank you for all that you are for us in Christ Jesus. And we ask all of these things in his name. Amen.